Right, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to, to the first of today's uh, specially commissioned joint scrutinies. This is a joint scrutiny between the Customer and Corporate Services and Scrutiny Management Committee and the Health and Adult Social Care uh, scrutiny committee. Um, what I'm going to do is um, just do some basic bits of housekeeping, some introductions, and then move us on to the, the main agenda. So just in terms of housekeeping, um, we're not expecting any fire alarms. So if the fire alarm does go off, uh, there'll be members of staff to help you out of the building, but we go back basically the way that you came into the building. Um, there are toilets which are through the door behind me. I'm not planning to take an adjournment um, during this meeting, but if you do need to nip out to the loo, do feel free to just uh, find your way uh, back out there. Uh, and if you have a mobile phone with you, please can you make sure that it's either switched off or on silent? Thank you. Um, in terms of introductions, I'm just going to uh, sort of work our way around the room so that everybody knows uh, who's in the building and, and who's with us. Um, so, first of all, down my left-hand side, uh, we have uh, a number of officers of the council. Um, so, we've got Neil Ferris, who is the Corporate Director of Place, James Gilchrist, who is Director of Environment, Transport and Planning, Andy Kerr, who is Head of Regeneration Programmes, and Dave Atkinson, who is Head of Programmes and Smart Place. And also on the end there is Councillor Runciman, who is the Executive Member for Adult Social Care. Then down my right hand side, we have some external participants uh, who are here with us today, and they will be uh, sitting at the table throughout the meeting. So just working my way down, we have uh, Helen Jones, who's here representing York Disability Rights Forum. We have uh, Jane Burton, who is here representing York Accessibility Action, but she's also Chair of Lawyers uh, with Disabilities Division of the Law Society of England and Wales, and is a member of the Law Society Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Committee. Uh, we then have Jim Cannon, who is here as the Chair of the York Older People's Assembly. We have Scott Jobson, who is the Chief Executive of MySite York. Uh, we then have Professor Paul Grady, uh, who is the Director of the Centre of Applied Human Rights at the University of York and a member of both the Human Rights and Equalities Board and an, as an Executive Member of the York Human Rights City Network. And it's in that latter capacity that he's speaking to us this afternoon. Uh, and then we have uh, David Harbon, who is the Chair of Trustees of York CVS. Uh, and he was recently asked to be an independent chair of a meeting that was requested by the Human Rights and Equalities Board between council officers and a range of groups with an interest in accessibility issues. And so he's here to give us some feedback from, from that meeting. Um, on my right, I have uh, Councillor Doughty, who is the chair of the um, Health Scrutiny Committee. Uh, on my left, I have uh, Janie, Janie Berry, who is the uh, Director of Governance at the Council. And uh, we also have Jane Mellor, who's the Democracy Officer. So I think that that's pretty much everybody covered. Of course, shouldn't forget to mention the two committees down at the far end. I've broadly got you set up on the right hand side as, as the uh, health committee and on the left hand side as uh, CSMC. In terms of apologies, uh, we have had a number of apologies uh, for today's meeting. Um, so just to run through them quickly, uh, Councillor Wan is being substituted by Councillor Mason, although he has said that he may arrive slightly late. Councillor Musson is being substituted by Councillor Douglas. Councillor Norman is being substituted by Councillor Looker. Um, Councillor, I'm trying to remember who Councillor Webb's here is substituting for. Oh. Councillor Taylor, sorry, there's quite a number. Councillor Callum Taylor um, is being substituted by Councillor Webb. And then uh, Councillor Pearson and Councillor Rowley are both unable to attend without substitutes. We are expecting Councillor Barnes, who's indicated he might be 10 to 15 minutes late. And likewise, I think we are expecting Councillor Vassy to attend as well, but obviously is, is running slightly late. So, uh, if I could just give us a very, very brief um, expectation of what we're going to be doing today uh, and then move us on to the formal agenda. So, this is the first of three meetings which will be looking at this uh, topic, broadly um, the um, topic of um, sort of city centre, the, the accessibility vision for the city centre uh, and, and some of the um, thoughts about how we go forward with, with the city centre. Um, these first two meetings today are really about information gathering and about uh, listening to a variety of different sources um, in terms of um, people's experience. So I'll be asking officers to give some presentations. I've asked um, some of the external um, 
people to give us a little overview and then uh, essentially I'm expecting a bit of a free-for-all from everybody in terms of asking questions. Um, everybody is very welcome to ask questions of everybody else. Um, the one thing that I would like to just stress though is that um, I know that there are a number of issues linked to this topic which are very uh, sensitive and uh, can be quite difficult uh, in terms of people's feelings around them. It is really important that we retain a professional and constructive um, meeting throughout. Uh, I would like to make sure that everything comes through me as the chair. So if you are wanting to participate, please raise your hand to say that you want to speak. Um, what I will try to do is keep a list of people who are wanting to come in. If it's something that you want to say on the particular topic that's being discussed at that moment if you could just indicate to me by a kind of a wave of a hand or just say that it's a supplementary question and i will try to bring you in as much as i can to keep that a flowing uh, conversation but please don't be speaking over the top of anybody don't cut anybody off um it all needs to to come through me please so on to the formal agenda um, and the first item uh, is declarations of interest so do any of the members present have any interest that they wish to declare can't see anything from any of the members of the committee i'm just going to declare a personal interest uh, which is a non-prejudicial interest um, which is i think most of you or many of you do know that my mum is a member of the human rights and equalities board also a member of uh, the York Disability Rights Forum Steering Group and uh, a member of the York Human Rights City Network Steering Group. Um, she's not a blue badge holder, she's not got any financial interest in any of the above, uh, all of which are voluntary positions. Um, and as far as I'm aware, um, she didn't have any prior involvement uh, or, or very little involvement in the drawing up of the um, Human Rights City Network paper. Um, which uh, she and I didn't discuss prior to its publication. So I just wanted to be completely transparent about that. On to agenda item two then, which is the public participation. Um, we have one member of the public uh, registered to speak, uh, which is Mrs. Diane Roweth, who I think is here speaking on behalf of York Site Loss Council. Um, so uh, Mrs. Roth is sat at the table at the moment in the in a position for the public speaker. Um, the way we do this is you have three minutes to address the committee. I'll give you a sort of 30 second warning um, when you're coming towards the end of that three minutes. And then once you've said your piece, uh, if you could withdraw from the table and, and just sit in one of the chairs at the back of the room, you're, you're very welcome to then stay throughout the meeting. Um, but just to be clear that it's not at the table, if you, if you see what I mean. So um, whenever you're ready to start, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. The government's national disability strategy tells us disabled people have been affected the most of anybody by COVID-19. And I quote, as we emerge from the long shadow of coronavirus, I, the Prime Minister, wants to build back better and fairer for all disabled people. It goes on to say that disabled people's lives are defined not by their own decisions, but by the decisions other people take. And this is really important to remember right now. Decisions being taken by officers and elected members are having enormous negative impact on the lives of disabled people who have a blue badge or may be entitled to a blue badge in future because we are looking well into the future with these decisions. In the 25 years since the introduction of the Disability Discrimination Act, access to our city centre has become more and more restricted. Now we are faced with losing it altogether, which is very serious. A city centre that cannot be accessed independently by blue badge holders is a very serious loss indeed, and not one to be proud of. Pre-COVID, blue badge holders had a right of access to the city centre. Emergency powers took that right away. Emergency powers extended the foot street zone, removing streets used by disabled people, denying them access to play. Emergency powers increased the hours of foot streets, a further blow to disabled people who are faced with only having independent access from eight o'clock in the evening to 10.30 in the morning. No more cinema trips or visits to restaurants in quieter times, no more catching shops that stay open later. Emergency powers have allowed large numbers of businesses to use the public highway for their own purposes. 
The loss of the pavement as a safe walking place is a blow and it funnels pedestrians into smaller and smaller spaces, making uh, walking unpleasant for everyone. And this flies in the face of the council's own A board policy, which is still in force. And it says, there is necessity to ensure that the primary purpose of the public highway is achieved and upheld. The council has duties under both highway and equality legislation and wants to respond proactively to them. All of these losses for blue badge holders created through emergency powers in a pandemic situation should not be made permanent. They unlawfully discriminate against disabled people and the basis on which decisions are made in some instances is dubious, lacking facts to back up on, um, lacking back, facts to black up conclusions and demonstrating scant understanding of the council's equality duty. That's 30 seconds, please. If we are to build back better and fairer, we must acknowledge that emergency powers are just that. They have a purpose at a time. They should not dictate the future. Please call a halt now. Look to use the Human Rights Network paper as a fresh start in deciding what is best for our city. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure that uh, members will take into account all of those points that you raise uh, during the course of our discussion. Thank you. Thank you. So if I could bring us then on to uh, agenda item three, which is the um, substantive item for today's meeting, um, which is titled City Centre Vision Accessibility. The uh, makeup of the two committees today, I, I suspect that this meeting will largely be focused on uh, some of the issues around accessibility. Um, but uh, if I could first of all invite uh, officers to uh, give us their presentation on uh, the reports uh, that you've uh, linked with us, uh, and then I will uh, take us over to the other members. Neil, do you want to? I'll just introduce. Uh, so, um, executive are considering four papers on the 18th of November and no decisions in terms of the ongoing arrangements for the foot streets have yet been made. And the issues for consideration are all laid out in the main body of the report. And as Councillor Crawshaw has noted, the covering report highlights that this committee may wish to take a special interest in some areas of the balance of the decisions that members will have to make on the 18th of November. And Andy in his presentation will run through some of those issues that we think the committee might wish to explore. But clearly the whole report is there for you to explore. Uh, finally, I'll just note that the appendix, which is the Human Rights City Network report, is not a report of the Council, it's not a report that has been prepared by officers, but we will be providing an analysis of that report for Executive in terms of their decision making on the 18th of November. I'll hand over to Andy. Chair, could I just ask that everybody... Um, uh, be mindful of the fact that the size of the room and the number of people in here and speak up and into the microphone, please, because it's really difficult for everybody to hear you. Thank you. Yeah, noted. Thank you. Oh, um. So uh, just to move on, as, as Neil set out, there are four reports um, which are associated. Sorry, one second, the screen's not flicked over. There we go. Um, there are four reports which are going to November executive uh, consider a number of interrelated decisions. Uh, so one is around the My City Centre vision, which is setting the long term 10 year vision for the future of the city centre. Sitting underneath that is a strategic review of city centre access and council car parking, and that report has looked at ways access to the city centre can be improved uh, to and through the foot street areas. And then the third report is a decision on the future of the foot streets. Um, so that's the one that looks at the geography of the foot streets and, and uh, what, which streets should be included permanently or not. And then there is a final report which uh, sets out some changes to dial ride funding and how that service is, is funded. So each of those reports will have an equalities impact assessment attached to them. And we have sought external specialist legal advice uh, on the council's duties under the Equalities Act, given the, the scale of the decisions uh, that we're looking at. 
So in terms of this scrutiny committee, um, what um, what we would like as, as, as officers to try and understand from that is, um, are there any impacts, positive or negative, that we haven't yet understood, uh, which relate to health and adult social care issues? Um, we've tried to look at things through the lens of pe people's safety, through health and well-being, the impact on disabled people, and then particularly blue badge holders um, and carers as well. But we want to understand if there are any others that we haven't yet understood or have missed. So just to set out the approach to public engagement, just so that there's um, a baseline of, of the amount of, of work and discussions that we've had to date, um, we've developed insight and understanding for extensive and layered engagement since spring 2019. So we've had six different phases of engagement um, since that period when we introduced the temporary traffic uh, regulation order, which did extend the, the area of the foot streets. We've had 170 attendees at 12 workshops, uh, which covered access to the city centre and the impact of counter-terrorism and COVID changes to the foot streets. Um, we obviously have been in COVID time, so a lot of those have been taking place um, online rather than in person in Zoom workshops. We've had 620 responses from disabled residents, including 540 from blue badge holders to the surveys that have taken place both on and offline. And we've had citywide mail outs to every blue badge holder in, in York and free free post return for those surveys to ensure that people could uh, respond back to us with their views. We've promoted it in the media uh, to ensure there's been full awareness and we've used our social media accounts, the, the council's corporate accounts, but also the My City Centre uh, accounts that exist as well. And we've continued to work with disabled organisations to disseminate that information more broadly. We've um, had briefings and we've attended different groups, including the York Disability Rights Forum, My Site York, the Advocacy Forum, Age Friendly York and York Human Rights City Network. Uh, there was a meeting last week of that as well. And we've tried to work to make sure the engagement is accessible as possible. So the initial workshops took place, we co-facilitated with York Disability Rights Forum. And at each of the um, workshops that we've run, we've had British Sign Language translators and we've used easy read versions and information distributed through our partners. And in terms of transparency, uh, we've published community open briefs, um, which are very extensive. I think 6,000 words, the first open brief, which really captured the, uh, the sort of depth of understanding that we had and was signed off by York Disability Rights Forum, and then published minutes of every workshop we've held uh, to ensure there was a, a, an accurate record of those meetings. So just touching on the council's uh, equalities duties, we, we must have regard in any decisions we take um, to eliminate unlawful discrimination, advance equality of opportunity between people who share a characteristic and, and those who do not, and foster good relations. So the strategic review of city centre access, um, this is the proposed model which has been engaged on at the moment. The public engagement on this piece closes today actually on the strategic review of access and then the report will be taken to November executive. And um, we've set out some key principles for access to the city centre and recommendations that should uh, generally be consistent with this approach in that um, this again, this has been engaged on, it's something that we're testing with the public. So the principle being that walking and mobility aids can, uh, can access through the foot streets area themselves, that cycling buses and blue badge parking and e-scooters then um, broadly park around the edge of the foot street areas and people travel through the foot streets, whatever the geography of those foot streets is defined as, and that cars should seek to use the inner ring road and, and park outside of the inner ring road wherever possible. So we're testing the principles of that currently. And then also a number of options to improve access to and through the foot street area, which again, the engagement is live on that. So these have not been decided on and what will form the basis of the final decisions in November. But a couple of key ones in there, particularly around should the foot street start at 12 noon uh, during weekdays in less busy times of the year to facilitate uh, longer periods of blue badge access to the foot street areas. And then a series of mitigations, um, looking at creating further disabled parking bays, investing in shop mobility and dial ride service, having more benches across the city centre in key spaces that we co-design with disabled people, improving toilets and poor quality pavement. So a whole raft of measures that we're currently testing and that engagement closes today. The future of the foot street decision, um, one of the key, key things we need to look at is what is the reason for considering a change? So there's a raft of different elements that sit uh, between that and counter-terrorism measures is one element, reducing pedestrian vehicle conflict in high footfall areas, 
um, allowing pavement cafe licences to continue. Uh, there's been 100 granted under the uh, government's revised pandemic measures currently. Uh, so we need to consider the future of those. Delivering that My City Centre vision and the economic success of the city and improving quality of play. So, so those are some of the drivers that led the executive to open the statutory consultation on whether the foot streets should be expanded. The streets and public squares that are proposed are, are in sort of three broad places. One is Blake Street, St Helens Square and Lendl. One is then Goodrum Gate, Church Street, King Square and Collier Gate. And then the other is Castle Gate. Um, it's just to mention that uh, College Green um, and uh, the area to the top of Goodrum Gate where, where Monk Bar connects um, and Dean Gate, they were also part of the foot streets through the emergency COVID response, but we took them out to try and facilitate more blue badge parking back into the city centre based on the engagement we've done with disabled groups. So have we understood the impacts? These are the key um, issues that have arisen from our public engagement. So that there are a diverse range of access barriers to overcome across the city centre, not just around the foot streets. There are some tangible benefits of the foot streets, but to those who can access the foot street area. Um, and really realising those benefits to the foot streets sit around accessible features for street furniture, drop curbs being in the right places, um, even and wider parents, uh, pavements, sorry, improved communication needs and more knowledge of alternatives and better parking spaces. Uh, so quality of parking bays is, is, is as important as where the location is for some people. And they led to November 2020 decisions and the implement and, and the sorry the inception of this strategic review of access uh, and the decision to consult on whether the foot street should become permanent. There are a group of blue badge holders who feel no mitigation is possible and that the council's actions are discriminatory. Uh, their position as a blue badge is a mitigation in itself and that their car is their independence. It's not a transport preference, but it gives them a safe haven, a place uh, where they can store medicine and equipment. Uh, that blue badge holders cannot walk 150 metres unaided, and that impacts then on the, the, uh, where people need to be within the foot streets, and that mobility aids are not appropriate for some people. I think one, one respondent, uh, for example, said that using one will con contradict their medical advice, as an example. Um, and they maintain that only a small number would require an exemption if we did continue to allow blue, ba blue badge parking within, uh, within the foot streets. But um, I think there are, we've got to work through issues whether there's any criteria or legal basis to allow that at a national level. So mitigation accommodation. So we have put in place a set out in the report that, that has been presented today um, in response to the findings of the public engagement. Um, we have set out proposals that are currently being engaged on and um, work continues to explore and we remain keen to understand based on today and the decision making process whether there are any further mitigations that we've not yet identified which could be included. But I think one key point that we just want to focus on because this is, this is um, a, a key point on the equalities act that in making any decision the impact has to be understood of that decision. So there are some disabled people who do benefit from a vehicle and cycle free environments, uh, but for some blue badge holders, uh, quality of parking spaces and access routes for them is most important and their needs can potentially be met by car parks across the city. For others, distance is an issue, but they may use a mobility aid or a replacement blue badge parking we've identified can meet the, uh, mitigate the impact. However, some have said that their access needs to the foot street can only be met by parking on one of the streets they previously used. And some of the reasons for that are around other locations are considered too far or a mobility aid is not an appropriate solution for their disability or their car is their safe space and accessing the foot streets before 10 30 a.m when the hours start isn't possible so the mitigations that meet the needs of this group of people that haven't been identified and if proposals go ahead um, they have made clear that they will be excluded from the foot streets and i think that's really clear that 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 has to be made clear in making any decisions that are taken by the executive in November. So just to finish on that point, in taking the decision, these are the elements the executive will need to balance and weigh up. So meeting the council's duties under the Equalities Act, the duty to keep people safe and the upcoming duty to protect legislation, responses to both the statutory consultation and the wider engagement that we've undertaken, and the proposed mitigations that have been put in place. Crucially, the impact on those who are negatively affected, as well as businesses and the delivery of our city strategies, and of course, any issues that rise, arise through scrutiny today and the decision-making processes that follow. Thank you very much for that. Um, Councillor Fenton, was that a question? 
Yep. You just just hang on one second, Helen. If we can get that microphone working, and then it's I working. Will continue. It's working Go on. Just just one thing you mentioned in your slides, Andy. You were talking about the experimental um, traffic regulation ordering spring, spring twenty nineteen. Can you just briefly explain? Because obviously the the emergency restrictions in terms of the reduction in the um, full street areas was 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 a, a COVID. Um, uh, apologies. That, issue. That Can you just explain area. what the spring 2019 yeah. restrictions were? All Sorry, about? apologies. That was that. That's um, slide came from endangered colleagues, but that was it's the uh, temporary traffic regulation order, and that is summer 20. Uh, sorry, spring 2020. So the actual COVID response. Uh, apologies, that was an error within the presentation. Helen, if it was just a point of clarification, you're welcome. To um, yes, in the slides it said about um, blue badge holders not being able to walk 150 metres, but one of the main reasons people get a blue badge is generally through something like PIP, where you have to display you can't walk 50 metres. And I think it's um, Age UK guidance suggests that if you can walk more than 80 metres well, um, that you wouldn't get a blue badge. So I just it's a big difference between 80 and 150. Thank you. I think if you just take a note on that and then what we'll do is um, rather than take questions on the officer report right now, I'm, I'm going to just come down this side with the, the people who are here from external organisations and, and just invite um, each of you to um, give a kind of brief introduction of, of who you are and who you're representing and a little bit of information about perhaps um, your experience and also um, what involvement um, you've, you've had today. And, and actually, Helen, as your, as your top, I, I shall just work down in order. So I'll, I'll start with you. OK, um, I'm Helen um, Jones. I'm part of the steering group for York Disability Rights Forum. We were formed um, early spring 2020 and sort of found ourselves having to start acting very, very soon um, because of the city centre access issue. Um, since that point, we have been involved with various um, reports and things that the council have produced. But for the last 18, whatever months it is, um, we have continually heard by phone, by email, on social media, over and over again, very, very frustrated people who can no longer get to their pharmacy or take their kid into um, town. And it might seem a small issue if you aren't affected, but if you are, it's an incredibly big emotional issue and it is taking away people's lives. Thank you. Um, Jane, if you'd like to give us a bit of an overview. I'm Jane Burton. I'm here today uh, on behalf of York Accessibility Action. And I'm also chair of the Lawyers with Disabilities Division of the Law Society. And I'm on the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Committee at the Law Society. But I'm here today as a disabled woman as well, who lives in the city. Section 149 of the Equality Act gives a specific protection to disabled people it is clear that under the law that disabled people are not being given the protection they're due here in York and there have not been suitable mitigations provided. Adjustments can and must be made to ensure that disabled people are on an equal footing. This has just not happened. Adjustments have been removed with no realistic mitigation put in place. Shared loading and blue badge bays are not working. There is a scrum situation in Duncan Place in front of the Minster and the replacement parking bays there are too far away from the city centre streets to access. The taxi service that was provided wasn't suitable for many reasons. Shop mobility is suitable for some, but costly and time limited as is, as is dial -a ride The York Civic Trust Transport Advisory Group, which I sit on has stated in their policy documents and responses to York City of Council, City of York Council consultations, that they must allow access to the city centre for disabled people within the foot streets area that's now closed. 
The human rights organizations in York also agree with this. Both uh, York Disability Rights Foundation and York Accessibility Action have said that access must be restored. Many disabled people have contacted both these organizations with sadness, frustration, telling heartbreaking stories of blatant discrimination and exclusion. Many people have spoken to us, including over 1,900 signatures on the petition close to us. These temporary measures have taken away the dignity and independence of at least 7,500 blue badge holders in the city, as well as the older population who relied on taxis to access the city centre because taxis are also not allowed to enter. There is no accessibility officer at the council and it would seem that consequently, this is no longer as an open and accessible city as it had been previously. And the Civic Trust Tag Group also recommended that one should be appointed. It does make me wonder if nothing has been learned from the London Bridge experience. We are waiting for justice and common sense to prevail. Fair-minded people can't believe this is happening. It is having a cruel and discriminatory impact. Because of decisions made during a state of emergency, real people, residents and voters have been excluded from the city centre. Those who are able to go into the city centre before 10.30, and not everyone can do this because of their health issues, uh, before the 10.30 deadline, as many shops don't open until 10 o'clock, then you really have to go to one shop on, on each visit if you can get in then. Others have had to take time off work to go in at that point. Personally, I have only been into the city centre and I live near Skeldergate Bridge twice since June 2020 when the shops have been open. Previously, I visited regularly living so close to the centre. I have instead gone to Leeds to buy things, furniture, clothes, shoes, and so will many other disabled people spending their purple pound elsewhere in a time of financial crisis when shops are closing. Money that I was, uh, sorry, I've also not been to City Screen. I haven't been able to go into town and meet my friends to have a coffee in all this time, something that I did regularly before. I just took it for granted, to be honest. I know a lot of uh, disabled people are having to go to Harrogate, Selby, Easing World to renew their passports or to do any business at a central post office, because as you well know, uh, the Lendl post office was moved into WH Smiths, so it's not accessible till, at all from so many people. My aunt, who's 84, always lived in the city, like myself, She's a blue badge holder. She wanted to attend a family celebration at Bill's for her grandson's birthday. She was dropped off at one end of Coney Street and it took her 20 minutes to struggle up with help from two people and arrived exhausted and just can't understand why this is happening and why she should be excluded. We have heard talk of safety, although we have never heard of any accidents involving blue badge drivers in the city centre. We were limited to 10 miles an hour, and I certainly respected that. I think maybe better enforcement might be something that could be looked at. Delivery drivers, post office vans enter the city centre, and surely a system could be installed to allow blue badge holders in too. Both Chester in the England and Freiburg in Germany are good examples of how to do it right. This is a terrible example of how to do things wrong. There have been constant consultations with ill-worded and biased questions, the results of which have been twisted at times to try and pit one group of disabled people against another, which is not the case. We have the feeling that we will continue to be bombarded with consultations until we give in. We won't. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jane. Uh, I'm just going to keep on moving down the line for now. So um, on to you, Jim, please. Uh, my name is Jim Cannon, and I chair York Older Assembly, Older People's Assembly. We are 
a, an organization which is involved in campaigning, distributing information to older people, keeping people informed of what's going on. We work closely with the council on many issues, including the council's policy on uh, implementing age-friendly city. And we have contributed in providing uh, comments, surveys, and so on, on such things as the pavements, as the availability of toilets and seating in the center of the city, because older people do like to come into the city. In many people, in many cases, it's the only time they will actually see people to talk to. And we have to remember that one of the big issues that is covered by the council's health and well-being policy is the question of isolation. And isolation is not just for the older people who are there now, but it's the older people of the future. And let's not forget, you'll all fall into that category at some point. Um, as far as the, uh, the current policies concerned on the uh, disabled access, blue badge owners and so on. There are two specific items I'd like to raise. One is that there is a center, uh, the St. Samson Center, which is bang in the middle of the city, is now no longer accessible to blue badge holders. And the St. Samson Center is a big, important center for older people, allowing them to meet with their friends on a regular basis and to, again, in many cases, get a free, uh, a cheap meal. Um, it is a, an important social center. If you go there now, you will discover that the number of people attending is significantly down on pre-COVID. And the, there are obviously a variety of reasons for that, but it is a significant factor. And access there is a big issue. Another point where access is important, in our case, we have our public meetings in the Quakers meeting house in Friargate, Castlegate. And it's a big drawback that people cannot park there. We've only had one meeting since uh, COVID hit us in face-to-face, in -face, but the intention is to have many more. Uh, this is going to be a really big issue for people um, who won't be able to get there. So I, I point, that, that, point that out to you. And the final point is, um, in the, the papers which I read diligently, I noticed that application had been made to the Secretary of State for the extension of the current temporary uh, traffic order to September 2022. I came here today hoping that there'd be an opportunity to express views of support for those who are struggling because of the new restrictions, or as it's stated, the removal of the exemption for blue badge holders. Uh, and yet the impression one gains is that the decision has already been taken and that there is little room for maneuver. I do hope that is not the case because it is absolutely critical that we make sure that there is decent access for people who need that access for social reasons. Thank you. Thanks, Jim, for that. And uh, Scott, I see you're already ready. So Brilliant. Thank you, Chair. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Scott Jobson. I'm the Chief Executive of My Sight York. We, uh, if you don't know, provide services to blind and partially sighted people across York, things such as befriending, equipment, information, advice, that type of thing, uh, community and social activities. I started this role, I suppose, 18 months ago when, when the uh, pandemic was at its height, it was at the start of all of that. It's all I've kind of known in York is the, is the um, widening of foot streets, which, which was viewed initially as a good thing for blind and partially sighted people because it enabled um, uh, easier, social distancing that was very, very difficult in the outset. Um, and what I've, I suppose, come to, to find in, in that time is there's been a significant shift over, yes, that was a, it was a good thing initially, the widening of foot streets. However, um, it's come at a, a significant cost to people's um, access to city center, which, is a, which has been a, a huge um, negative, 
effect has a huge negative effect on people's uh, on people's lives. And when we're talking about exclusion of, of, of for blue badges or, or cars and vehicles and things like that, I think it's important to note that we're talking about people, real people of um, friends and families and, and relatives. And I feel a, a bit of a, quite a deep shame that we're that this proposal is um, to treat people like this is going ahead. So I suppose I'm here today to to stand in absolute uh, unison as, as a single disability sector and to lend my support to um, to request access back to the to the city centre. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Um, and I'll now move on to uh, Paul. Uh, if you could perhaps, I, I suppose, in a way. Your input and David's input might be just slightly different. We've, we've sort of had a bit of kind of more personal testimony, I suppose. Uh, and I think you um, are going to speak to your report, which um, was, was published um, uh, on about the 20th of October, I think, wasn't it? But um, yeah. if, if I could hand over to you, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, thanks for this opportunity. Um, I'm here speaking on behalf of the York Human Rights City Network, which is a civil, so civil society coalition. Um, and we produced this report at the invitation of the Human Rights and Equalities Board, which is led by the council itself and institutionalizes the city's commitment to being the UK's first human rights city. I suppose I, I wanna start really by saying that this feels to me like from the perspective of our work over the last decade in the city is something of a test case. It really does speak to, not just in human rights terms, but more broadly, what kind of a city do we want to create? What kind of a city do we want to, to live in? Um, and I'll come back to, I guess, the, you know, how this issue seems to have become so polarized within the city, despite the work which the council has done, which has, been, has already been, been outlined. But I do feel that the damage in terms of human rights and more broadly in terms of the social justice profile of this city um, will be very significant um, if some of the voices around this table are not heard over the coming weeks. The paper sets out, uh, I guess, a human rights approach to this issue, and I'm not going to go through it in any detail. The paper has been in the public domain for some time, but the, the key issues of which there are three are firstly, that human rights um, promote non-discrimination against majority concerns. So consultations, elections, things like that are designed to uh, solicit majority views within a city and more broadly, um, but they can discriminate sometimes systematically against minority concerns and human rights is a protection for minority groups against that. We also talk about, it's important to acknowledge that there are rights concerns on both sides of this debate, perhaps most obviously the terrorism concerns facing the city. Um, and the Equalities Act and the Human Rights Act set out some means for trying to balance these concerns in complex decisions like the one we're facing here. The thing I guess I would say by way of sort of summation is that if the council wishes to proceed with a measure that knowingly discriminates against an already discriminated group, then the bar, the legal bar in terms of the process that has to be followed and the justification that has to be provided for those measures is a very high one. And the final point relates to participation. Um, and again, I think there's a broader context here. My, my sense of working in the city is that when you talk to people within the council, often they feel that consultation and participation is done well. When you talk to civil society groups, they rarely do. And this is a, a case study of, I think, a broader challenge within the city of how do we collaborate around making decisions? Because despite all the consultation that's happened, and there's clearly been a good deal, we still seem to have arrived at a position where positions are very polarized um, around this table and within the wider York community. We look at other cities and it does seem to us that in like fairly similar cities, Chester and Bath to ours, they both have better structures and procedures in place for making these kinds of decisions. So access offices, access, uh, disability access forums, those kinds of 
mechanisms that are in place that would facilitate these kinds of difficult decisions, but also that they do seem to have reached better accommodations of diverse interests in, in, out, in outcomes, in the final outcomes that they've made. So our conclusion based on human rights law and other case cities within the UK is that a better accommodation of interests is both desirable, but also possible. It may take a little bit more time than currently being considered. But I would come back in the week after York, uh, I believe, became embraced the idea of being a non-racist city on the basis of inclusion. Do we really, in a matter of weeks, want to take on board a measure that will exclude an already marginalized group within the city? Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. And then um, the final uh, external speaker today is uh, David Harbin. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. My name is David Harborn, and I chair the trustees of York CVS. Uh, I was asked to come on board in the hope that by chairing a meeting of that involves people with disabilities and their representatives, together with council officers and um, uh, Superintendent Khan from the police, that perhaps we might start to find a way forward. All of this is it, uh, my involvement is quite late in the day, it has to be said, that meeting only took place last week. So what I'm going to give you is some largely impressions based on that meeting. I will also say for the sake of full disclosure that my late wife had a blue badge, but she died in 2009, so that's not a current conflict. Uh, my mother and aunt both are current blue badge holders, so I have some family insight into uh, the use of blue badges. Um, but I've approached this partly from a, a past experience of way back when being a civil servant and trying to look at where the heart of the issues lie. At last week's meeting, I deliberately chose to break the meeting into three components. One was to start with the points of principle. Uh, then we moved on to the reasons for the Foot Street, proposed Foot Street closures. And thirdly, to explore um, the uh, likelihood or the opportunity to further amend the proposals that are currently uh, going through consultation with that process ending today. Uh, in some ways, I don't need to go back over the first part of the meeting on principle because we've heard about that. We've heard from Paul about the human rights and equalities dimensions and the fact that disabled people, including, of course, blue badge holders, have a right to private and family life. Uh, which is intruded upon uh, if they, if blue badge users are excluded from certain parts of the city for large parts of the day. But there was a wider um, issue, which I accepted under the heading of principle, a perception that the decision was taken before the consultation started and that the consultation was conducted in a way that matched the decision that had already been taken. Now, I can't tell you whether that's true. All I'm reporting is that is the impression I gained from people attending that meeting. And if that's true, that there is a perception, then I'm sure that's something that the council needs to take into account. And linked with that, a, a continuing sense that human rights have not been fully understood. Um, and I, you know, in order to uh, not single people out, I would say uh, there was a sense that perhaps the full human rights, as Paul has described them, have not been fully understood by the council or by the North Yorkshire Police. And then you get to the wider questions of justice and trust. Those words have already been used by other commenters this afternoon. Uh, and the, 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 the sense that this is un, in some way unjust, uh, but equally that trust is hard won but easily lost. There was a campaign to eliminate A-boards from the streets of York to benefit people with severe visual impairment. But now we have street cafes with tables, chairs, barriers, and in some cases platforms reaching not only on to pavements, but in some cases into carriageways, which appears on the surface of it, as presented to me at the last week's meeting, uh, to reverse the progress that had been made by the council in taking action on A boards. Now we move to the reasons for Foot Street closures and the, the, the closures we have at the moment were brought in as a response to the pandemic and the need to promote social distancing and the reopening of the economy as lockdown eased. 
Um, that has generated a sense of cafe culture and, uh, in, and as we've seen from the PowerPoint, extended the evening economy. And there is a sense, uh, certainly in, indeed in, in the papers for today's meeting, that that has provided the background for proposing the uh, continued extension of the Foot Street closures and making them permanent. Now, in light of the human rights and equalities issues, putting my ex-civil servant's hat on, I would say that that's not enough on its own to support the case for continued or permanent closure of all of the foot streets. A, Paul, a point that Paul made at the meeting last week was that majority preferences must not override the rights of minorities. And whilst it might be a majority preference to support cafe culture and the evening economy, we have to weigh that in this balance of human rights and equalities. However, two other arguments are put forward for extending the foot street closures. One is that it might reduce the likelihood of vehicles striking pedestrians. Uh, my observation there would be there is a lack of evidence that in fact there has been harm to pedestrians. I might have looked, I, I looked to find and did not find evidence along the lines of over the last 10 years, there have been this number of personal injury accidents as a result of blue badge users accessing the foot streets, equivalent to Y on a, a figure per, per annum, uh, which would then lead the officers to project a reduction in the level of personal injury action, accidents if the closures are made permanent but no figures have been provided. By the same token, and again, I'm in, ex, embracing the police in this comment, a lack of understanding of the number of people with blue badges who actually park in the foot streets. The figure that has been used most commonly is that there are seven and a half thousand blue badge users in the city. Um, a much higher figure was quoted at last week's meeting and then corrected. Um, but we don't know what proportion of that 7,500 actually ever parked in the city centre or continue to need to park in the city centre because no baseline data has been collected or provided. The third and final argument for the closures uh, concerns the anti-terrorism measures um, and what are called the extended HVM measures. And this is a way of reducing the risk that a terrorist would seek to kill and injure people by driving a seven and a half ton truck through the streets of York. Um, that seems to me a fairly powerful argument. And indeed, I would personally argue that the single most important piece of paper in today's pack is Annex 7 which shows the access points and fixed closures that would create an area within the city centre protected against attack by vehicle. However, that has been laid down as if it's something we have to take on block without further scope for discussion. The block that's described for one thing doesn't include Castlegate, and I will come back to that in a moment. Secondly, however, there's no reference to comparable cities that have already been mentioned, such as Chester and Bath, where my understanding, based on a very limited time of being involved with this, is that Chester has some access to the city centre using automatic number plate recognition. I gather that I might have got the wrong end of the stick in terms of the extent of the access to Chester City Centre, but nevertheless, ANPR is an option in Chester, and that in Bath, where proposals are being pursued just a few weeks ahead of where we are here in York, the public consultation led to a slight reduction in the proposed limited access areas in Bath, with access to blue badge users being envisaged as being provided by having movable barriers operated by the CCDV control room in the city of Bath. Now that leads to the question as to whether there is scope for movable barriers 
at Blake Street, perhaps, to provide access to Blake Street, St. Helens Square, and that part of Lenville between St. Helens Square and Museum Street, or perhaps at Goodrum Gate, leading to uh, King's Square and uh, Collier Gate. These, these options are not, not explored in these papers, and as far as I can tell, have not been explored as, a, as serious mitigations to improve access. At the moment, the only suggested additional mitigation appears to be that the foot streets might um, remain open to blue badge users for more hours in the morning. The consultation process that's completed today says that the council is minded to provide closure hours of 10.30 in the morning to 7 p.m., but does ask respondents if they think that the, uh, it should be later than 10.30 that this restriction comes in during the morning, during most of the year. An equivalent question is not asked about the 7 p.m. Um, lifting of the restrictions. So it seems to me that if there is a strong argument for making some closures permanent, it is based more on the proposed HVM measures than on any of the other proposals that have, or, or comments that are included in the papers so far. It seems to me that insufficient consideration has been given to further mitigations take, or to taking account of practice in comparable cities such as Bath and Chester, um, that we need to uh, consider whether there can be additional uh, access points for people with blue badges at Blake Street and or Goodrum Gate. Uh, as for Castlegate, uh, in today's papers, there isn't a single, not a single argument justifying the continued closure of Castlegate. It's not part of the HVM measures. Uh, previous documents that I have read suggest that because Castlegate will be part of the future Castle Gateway proposals, that perhaps we should close it now and save time later, which does not seem to me to be a very strong argument. The conclusion we reached last week was that actually, if there is a, a genuine desire to co-design a package of solutions that will meet people's needs, we need potentially a short extension of the current temporary traffic order because we know that the St. Nicholas Fair is coming up and we've got to protect the streets during that period so that further time can be given to looking at what could be done in terms of further mitigation, both in terms of the physical area and the times of opening, and also to consider uh, other points arising from the strategic review of city centre access and the legal advice that are not available to today's meeting. We should also take account of suggestions made elsewhere, including by York Civic, Civic Trust, that we perhaps need an access officer and a longer term accessibility forum, which can take account of the wider issues and ideas put forward by organisations such as York Civic Trust and those represented at last, meet, last week's meeting. I hope I've reflected fairly the points that were put at last week's meeting, and that's where I end. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. That's uh, been really helpful, and, and thank you to each of you for your, your input there. Um, I think what we need to be then thinking about as, as a committee, um, obviously we've heard um, a little bit of um, information about where we are currently, um, what the impacts uh, have been uh, on, on the temporary extension uh, of the Foot Streets area. Um, and I would sort of want to just add in as well, I think um, part of the discussion needs to think about not just the Foot Streets area, but it's about that more general conversation about accessibility into York and into the city centre. Um, and obviously we've got, we've had a, a sort of a, a presentation, a summary of, of where things are um, from the council perspective at the moment and, and where things might be um, heading. Um, and I suppose the question then is, what do we need to do to make sure that we get these decisions right? Um, because I think, you know, clearly there are different competing um, needs, requirements, obligations, whatever the right word is for that. But, you know, it's, it's quite clearly a number of uh, different things going on. 
Um, as I say, the focus of today's discussion, um, I really want to, to kind of keep on that issue around accessibility. Um, so what I'd like to do now is just invite um, members, um, any of the people who are attending as guests, likewise uh, officers, um, to offer thoughts, ask questions if there's any clarification that you want to uh, get on anything. Um, and if you could just indicate to me by a raise of a hand and I'll note you down and, and bring you in in the order. And as I said before, if there's a um, point that's being discussed that you want to just seek further clarification, if you just kind of give me a wave or shout supplementary or something like that, I will do my best to bring you in. So I've seen Helen's hand jump up first. I've seen Councillor Webb's hand and I can see Councillor Fenton's hand and I can see Neil's hand as well. So I'll go around in that order. I think in terms of moving forward, um, because I, I hope that's why we're all here, I think we've spoken about the issues enough times that you can go back and read that if you don't fully understand. Um, in terms of moving forward, I think there's it would be helpful to get some data about the crashes, the, or the incidents, sorry, the pedestrian vehicle incidents. Um, I had done some research um, and so my colleague down the table, um, we hadn't found particularly um, persuasive figures around that. So if that is available and that's something that's being used to make this argument, um, I think that needs to be clearly out on the table so that we're all aware of it. Um, I went into the city a couple of weeks ago and I tried to see what the speed limit was on um, Goodrum Gate. And I think I think maybe Diane had maybe said 10 miles an hour. Um, I couldn't clearly see that. Um, so if that is the speed limit, it needs to be enforced. It needs to be clearer. And obviously that in turn would then reduce any vehicle incidents. Um, I think for me, the other key piece of this puzzle is that respect that we are taxpayers, we are local people who are voting for you, and we are parts of families, we are residents, and it doesn't feel like we are being seen on the same level as other residents. The report today talks in various places about a family-friendly city, about a city that's welcoming to all, and it feels like we are the ones not included in that. And I think perhaps it's some of that's around the language. I don't fully understand the you know, phrasing, family-friendly city, but it, 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 it others us. And I think the, the issue has been going on for quite a long time. And I think people are feeling very jaded, particularly the people that I've spoken to. And I think it might sound like a little thing, but to acknowledge that we are residents, that we are, you know, part of the city too, I think would be a really strong start. Thank you, Helen. Um, I think th there was a couple of sort of specific questions in there, which if I can just, if I don't know if officers are able to answer quickly on, on those particular points. Um, and then I will come to Councillor Webb, who I think whose hand was next. But um, data on crashes within the city centre, do, do we know what data we have? And if we don't know, is that something that we could perhaps bring back to the 8th of November meeting when we're summarising all of this? Um, and speed limit within the city centre, I don't know to what extent it varies within the current foot streets area or not, but is anybody able to clarify what the speed limit currently is? And again, if not, can we have that back on the 8th? The answer is I'll bring them both back for the 8th to confirm clearly. That'd be great. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, next person was uh, Councillor Webb. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> On the, uh, the section right to the end, the last uh, appendix, the Human Rights Report on Blue Badge Exclusion in York, uh, and that was published by Human Rights City Network. Um, actually, it was asked to do that by the Human Rights and Equalities Board. In that report, on the, the second page, I think it is, right at the bottom, page 82 of your packs. It says, in short, while CYC has conducted um, uh, EIAs in relation to city centre access and blue, bed, blue badge access specifically, the data gathered has not been properly understood and analysed. 
And then in a, in a different part of the report, it, it, it references the idea that trust has broken down between CYC and disabled groups. And I imagine the two are, are linked together. I was wondering if I could ask potentially Councillor Runtsman as executive member in this area to comment and then to just sort of get maybe from, from yourself, sorry, I think oh, Professor Reid, is it? Yes. Um, maybe to comment a little bit more on what analysis should have been done or what needs to be done. Thank you, Councillor Webb. Councillor Runciman, if you're happy to just respond. Yes, I'll respond. Um, I would hope that trust has not broken down between the disability groups, which I am more than happy to visit if I'm invited, just like I visit the Older People's Assembly, more than happy. Uh, most people, uh, many people in this room will know that I'm deaf. Um, I'm using the loop at the moment. I'm pleased to tell Richard that it's working. Um, and I have, a, I have had a mother who was very disabled with rheumatoid arthritis, so I'm not unaware of disability issues. And I put that invitation out again. If any disability group would like me to come and visit them, I'm happy to do that. And I shall, of course, be going back to the Older People's Assembly, just like I have in the past. I think the question about... EIAs not being properly understood and analysed is a very important question and it may be that um, more training needs to be given or refresher training needs to be given to officers that fill in those um, that part of the report. Things change, things go on and unless you've got personal experience of disability like I have, it may be that it's not fully understood. So I think my comment would be that there should be consideration of retraining, not, not just for members, although that is always valuable, but for officers who fill in those reports. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Runciman. And, and Paul, if you wanted to add any further comment. Yes, thanks Thanks for the, for the question. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we wanted to get this report on four pages, so there's other things we could have said, but I think the main thing that we noticed reading the, the three main equalities impact assessments that we reference here is that while they do document um, equalities issues against protected characteristics, they then go on to say, so you know, for people with disabilities, carers, and so on, when, it, when they talk about when they go on to look at human rights, they say that there's no impact on human rights in terms of discrimination. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think when you say it like that, you, you can see it doesn't add up, basically. If you've, if you've listed a whole series of equalities issues, you can't then go on and say that there's no discriminatory impacts of the measures that are being considered. So, um, you know, there is a statutory duty to uh, demonstrate adequate and accurate equality evidence. And there are, I think, concerns about the equality impact assessments that have been conducted, uh, which that is the main one that we identify. Um, I mean, moving forward, the, the council is piloting a new human rights and equalities impact assessment tool and has asked the network actually for some training on that. So there may be, hopefully, um, an improvement in the way these, these are filled in. But clearly, in order to make the right decisions, you need to have the evidence right and the connections between the various human rights and equalities issues mapped out very clearly which, in my view, the, the assessments uh, in relation to the blue badge issue don't do. Thank you for that. Um, just on that subject, Jamie, I, I wonder, I don't know whether you're in a position to comment as Director of Governance, not on this specific equalities impact assessment at all, but just in, in general, when we as a council are producing equalities impact assessments, um, what is the mechanism by which that assessment, well, first of all, is, is completed, but then taken into account within decision making? And I suppose the question is, is what weight is that quality of impact assessment given within a decision making process? Because it's one of, one of a strand, I think, if, that's, if I've understood it correctly. Um, yes, it is correct that the council is currently piloting a new framework. Um, and so, 
pleased to hear that, um, and that's been referenced this afternoon, um, an, an EIA document should always be completed at the very outset, and that's in its basicest form. Thereafter, as our guidance is indicating, um, groups of people come together that contribute towards its development. And the EIA remains a living document throughout the entire process. So it will be, it is encouraged that it will be reviewed, renewed, refreshed at salient points, but also it is a key document to support all other documents. Um, my advice to any decision maker is that they should always be fully conversant with the content of an EIA when they're presented with a decision to make. And it is for each decision maker, both as a collective and as an individual, to give their preferred weight to the content of that document in respect of the decision that they're going to make. But you should always show consideration to an equalities impact assessment. Um, I'll bring, I think Councillor Douglas has got a supplementary, which I'll just bring in, just, just for my understanding on, on that as well then. So um, again, on this specific topic then, if there's a group suggesting that there are reasons for why the equalities impact assessment might not be um, quite correct at the moment, there would be an opportunity to um, potentially take, in, take on board those comments in advance of a decision that was ultimately being made that relied upon that document. Is that yeah, in very quick summary, yes, yeah, um, that is um, <laughs> part today's meeting also feeds into and contributes to the to the content of the EIA. So it's it's things that are heard, shared, expressed this afternoon will also take into account be taken into account in the EIA because it is a living document. Thank you, uh, Councillor Douglas. Thank you. Um, on EIA, so the, the process um, assessment is carried out at the first stage of um, when a project, for example, it, it comes into thought and is thought to be moved forward. What's our um, internal process for making sure that officers who are um, responsible for a project are referring back to that EIA consistently and making appropriate mitigations and challenging themselves to make sure that it, it is an active document and that it's been considered at every uh, point in time. Is that something you can understand? Yeah. Um, so there is an EIA at the initial outset um, or conception of a proposal. Um, it is very much for the officer or the project group to ensure that the EIA is reviewed and refreshed where necessary and updated because it is a living document, i.e. It's never, it's never signed off at a particular meeting. So it, get, it is always um, having to be considered. So my advice would be to all members who are chief officers, to all officers who are chief officers, that if, when you're responsible for a project, EIA should focus as part of that project. If there's no changes to make or no updates, that's absolutely fine, but it should still be a key consideration, a key document to be considered at, at your project meetings or um, departmental management team, wherever that project is being um, led and shared, and that key officers are aware of the existence of that document as well. So you may not be the author, for example, but actually you have the awareness and the ability to contribute to it. Thank you. Um, Helen, was that supplementary to this or, or just a, okay, I'll, I'll put you on to the list then. Uh, in which case, uh, I think we're now on to Councillor Fenton is the next question. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just a, a point of clarification and a couple of questions that officers might be able to pick up. Um, Neil Ferris mentioned that the, um, in relation to the Human Rights City Network report, which, which does raise um, some, some important, very important issues, that there was mention made of a, an analysis of the, uh, the issues raised in the report being prepared for executive later in November. Just wanted to ask if <clears throat> that analysis could also be shared with members of, of this committee prior to our meeting on the 8th of November. Um, I think it would be would be helpful to have if, if Neil can can consider that. Just a couple, couple of questions um, for, for, for officers, if I may. The uh, as we saw from the presentation, the uh, emergency measures were brought in in the spring of 2020. Um, just a question around whether whether any mitigations were considered at the time that those um, <clears throat> the increase in the, the uh, extent of the foot streets was was introduced in spring 2020 
and also mentions being made of uh, Chester and Bath. Um, just wanted to ask whether officers have had the opportunity to um, to reach out to those cities or to read up on um, measures that have been taken there, accepting that every city has um, has a different geography, but whether from what officers know of what has been happening in those cities, any reflections they might have might have on um, the applicability of some of those measures for York. Andy, did you want to pick that one up first? Yeah, so just in terms of spring 2020, we had uh, the government issued its safer public places guidance just um, at the same time as announcing the reopening of uh, firstly non-essential retail and then and then the city centre in general, we had about a three week period. So the actual decision was taken to introduce the foot streets under that emergency COVID legislation at pace. We, we realised that time it was going to have an impact um, on, on disabled groups, on blue badge holders. So we put in place a number of measures at the start. Uh, some of those uh, were around um, having a, a taxi shuttle service, which we, we work with disabled groups and for a lot of people that just wasn't an appropriate set of mitigations. So we continued to refine them through that summer. We removed Dean Gate from, uh, to allow more parking there and looked at other measures. So they were, they were sort of done um, quickly at first and some of those we didn't get right because we didn't have a chance to engage and we continued to try and evolve them as we went through the process. Um, and just in terms of Chester and, and Bath, um, we've we've had sort of conversations with uh, their emergency planning team, their parking team, and others. I mean, in terms of Chester, they don't use aut automatic number plate recognition. That is for pay on exit on their car parks. They have a staff barrier, uh, which is it controls access to the counter terrorism measures. Um, and through that staff barrier, um, blue badge holders can go in through that staff barrier, but. Uh, the, the security team has got the ability to restrict access if the city centre is too busy, so they remove access um, completely if, if the city centre reaches a certain footfall threshold. In terms of Bath, they currently don't allow any blue badge access into their pedestrianised areas. They are consulting at the moment about whether they can uh, allow some access in within a separate loop within their counter-terrorism measures, but they would need their own protection that sit all the way around that loop so that people can't get out into the wider Foot Street areas due to the counter-terrorism um, measures. So, I, I mean, I think the key point is it's about every city understanding its own risk to risk on its own profile and the risk that that city is uh, willing to take in terms of weighing up those balances. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I was, did you want to, was that supplementary to... to... Um, no, it's a, it's a later point. A later, so, yeah, I'll, I'll pop your name down then. Sorry. Uh, right. Uh, next on the list, I had Neil, I think you'd indicated. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, just to say, Helen, absolutely everybody is, as far as I'm concerned, is a citizen of York and we have responsibility to all citizens. So, just to, in terms of your request, absolutely 100% uh, happy to confirm that that's the situation. Again, in respect of the, the point in respect of uh, David, in terms of a decision being made, no, a decision hasn't been made. The report, the summary of the report that you can see in today's uh, papers, uh, those reports are not complete. There are no clear recommendations and there has been no decisions made. But I will in a moment refer to James in respect of the question around the emergency decisions. Um, in respect of Councillor Fenton's point in considering the analysis uh, for the human rights report we, yeah absolutely we'll consider that and if we're able to do so we'll share that with the csmc ahead of the uh, 8th of december 8th of november should i say um and in respect of the that analysis that will pick up the details of, that andy's talked about in respect of bath and chester and we'll get some formal responses so that we can understand in a little bit more detail what they're doing on the ground um it just on respect of the uh item as to the initial decision making by the authority, as uh, Andy highlighted, there was emergency decisions taken by officers in response to the government legislation. But I would also note the executive considered the matter in August, so within about five weeks of the implementation, and allocated £25,000 to undertake consultation with blue badge holders and uh, disability groups across the city so that they understood, uh, could start to understand the impact of emergency measures. It wasn't that. Uh, there wasn't an appetite to understand the impacts of what was being undertaken. Uh, and I'll now then pass on to James just to talk through where we are in respect to the emergency decisions. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, 
Thank you, Neil. Um, just to clarify, and I can't remember the exact wording, but I think Executive asked for all options to be available to them in November. And one of those options requires Secretary of State permission. Even if the Secretary of State gives that permission, it will be for Executive to decide whether to implement it or not. So it's just been applied for to give them that option in November. Um, and just coming on to the, uh, there was a comment made about um, cafe licenses enabled. I think it's just important to understand that normally, in normal times, a cafe license requires planning permission. Um, the government changed the legislation in response to COVID that took the planning process out of it. So they now uh, have a much more streamlined approach. But that is also part of the reason why the foot, we took vehicles out of the foot streets to create the space on the road for people to walk because the pavements are often blocked by these pavement cafes. So just understanding the, the subtle differences. Thank you, that's uh, helpful clarifications. Thank you there. Um, right, I'm just gonna work through the list of, of people. Uh, Councillor Mason, I've seen your hand up as well and I've added you to the list. Um, it's getting quite a long list. I'll add Councillor Baker as well. Um, what I'm going to do though is bump Councillor Doughty up the list slightly as chair of the um, health committee. So uh, Councillor Doughty, if you want to ask a question and then I've got Councillor Looker next. Thank you, Chair. It was actually, um in a large part supplementary to to what councillor fenton was was asking for um so obviously we're, we've heard and read that um that there hasn't been the analysis yet on the on the vision and accessibility consultation uh, which concludes today and um also um of the uh, page 19 um details uh, about the 909 online responses of which 23% were from disabled residents. Um, so until um, we can understand what those responses are and potentially mean, it doesn't give, I think, some difficulty in, in making rec recommendations as such um, without fully understanding that. And also then for um, our guests who have been invited today to um, to respond to the, to the analysis that's provided by officers ultimately. I think that's important because there might be some counter um, argument uh, perhaps about some of the um, analysis. Um, so that, that, I think that's important. So the, the earlier the, the, um, the, the information is shared and if it can be for obviously by the 8th at the very latest, then that, that, that would be um, important, I think. In terms of, um, I, it's not for me to say what recommendations we can make. Um, I, can, I, can, I can make suggestions um, um, and I can't speak for everyone on the committee. Um, they may well agree with me, but my, my thoughts are that we ought to be looking along the lines of, we've heard from um, two, two of the guests, um, the, the Chair of Trustees and the CVS and also um, we've seen the um, recommendations in the Human Rights Report, and within that, that makes some quite clear recommendations of what they believe, um, and this, uh, um, the Chair of Trustees and the CVS suggested we, that we perhaps consider ANPR and uh, move about, about barriers as well. So it'd be interesting to see what considerations all those and the recommendations that the human rights um, report suggests um, what would be workable um, and um, really I, I'd be wanting to hear um, if officers don't agree with these recommendations the reasons why they couldn't be implemented or why they don't agree with them so that executive can make a fully informed decision. Thanks, uh, Councillor Doughty. I, I, I guess that um, we've already had a, a commitment that um, we might get a response to this paper coming to the 8th of November. Um, it may be that um, members of this committee today might want to um, record sort of an, an endorsement perhaps of, of those proposals. Um, and obviously we'll, we'll come to that a bit further on. Um, I, I wouldn't want to necessarily put that to people right now, but um, I'll, I'll make a note to come back to that. And if you want to remind me if I don't, if I forget, uh, that'd be great, thank you. Um, so again, just going through uh, the list of people for, for asking questions. Um, so Councillor Looker was next, I think. 
I hardly recognize my own name. Um, I'm not sure if I'm asking a question or just throwing in some, some comments. Um, I'll declare a number of sort of vaguely personal interests in this. Um, one is I represent the city centre as one of the ward councillors for the Guildhall Ward, which is, I think, 85, could be 90% of the city centre as currently defined. And certainly um, as ward councillors, we did get some perhaps rather belated opportunities to feed into um, some of the uh, aftermath of the change in the restrictions to the foot streets, because obviously it impacted not just on blue badge holders, it actually impacted quite significantly on people who suddenly found themselves just living um, in the city center. And I remember some very strange, difficult, discussions with the residents of Castlegate who found themselves almost completely cut off from life as they knew it. So I, I, I am very conscious that there were some consultations, but some of them were, I have to say, a little bit belated. Um, but I want to speak as a, in part as well as somebody who has an interest that perhaps is not necessarily represented around this table particularly. I speak as somebody who, like Councillor Runciman, but I think I've got a few years ahead of her, um, is getting older, definitively getting older. I now no longer find it very easy to walk across the city centre, even though it isn't a very large city centre. Um, but I don't have a blue badge. I will never have a blue badge. My husband and I took a decision many, 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 many years ago to live our lives without a car. So neither of us have access to a car and neither of us can drive at all in any respect whatsoever. We've never had a license between us, um, which I sometimes feel is quite unique. But... Um, but it does strike me that there are quite significant numbers of people who will, as somebody was saying, we're all growing older, though some of us refuse to recognize it. Um, we are all growing older and a lot of those people will be growing older without a car and without the blue badge. And quite frankly, yes, get into um, St. Sampson Center. For me now um, is, a little bit of a, an extra challenge. And one of the things I have been thinking, I will just throw this into the table, onto the table, because I can see no reference to it anywhere in any of the papers. Looking at all the little bays with these blessed electric scooters everywhere, which are also causing mayhem. If you want to look at complications around the pavements, electric scooters are all over the place. Um, but why couldn't we have some of these bays with nice little mobility scooters so that you could, or I could, um, as a slightly elderly person, I could um, get the app, put my coin in the slot and have a little mobility scooter which would take me around. Now, I understand absolutely that not everybody can use them. I know they don't work for everybody. Like cars don't work for me. So, you know, we all have to, we all have these difficulties. And I'm not saying it is the answer to the problem because it isn't. Access of taxis to the city centre is another factor which I think could be considered because taxis are a form of public transport. But yes, I know there are definitely areas that are, can only accommodate their own private car. And that is something we are going to have to take on board. But I do think a variety of solutions that are available to a wide variety of people are what is going to make this very difficult, very difficult situation uh, um, achievable. And at the end of the day, consensus of a solution that applies to absolutely everybody may not be available, but we should at least reduce the number that are being disadvantaged to the absolute very smallest number. 
before we say we have reached enough. So I think there are a number of ways in which we can approach this. I'm very interested in reviewing perhaps the ways in which the um, traffic free area, can, the timing this can be changed, 10 o'clock or 10.30, whatever, to seven or eight is actually a very long time. It is a very long time and it does cut you off from those more sociable opportunities that we all enjoy. So I just throw those ideas out onto the table and I hope we will at some point have opportunities to discuss them in more detail and canvas some of them more closely. But I do think we have got to take this extremely seriously and see what we can find to make as much consensus among us all as we possibly can reach. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Lucca. I think Helen was wanting to just make a, a, a comment in response to, to some of that. Yes, um, just a couple of things. Um, I do think there is a role for some people to have that mobility kind of scooter, whatever it would be, um, you know, aligned with the current electric scooter system. Um, and I think you've mentioned something towards the end there that really echoes um, York Disability Rights Forum's kind of approach with this right from the very, very first meetings we were having um, with the council. And that is that there is not going to be a single solution. It is going to be a jigsaw of solutions. For some people, it will be better car parks. For some people, it could be something like that. And that improving the access in the city centre, like to get across physically, adding more benches, all of these are part of that jigsaw. So long as we don't get stuck on the idea that if we put all of these things in place, we end up with a complete jigsaw, there will still be that piece in the middle where it's people who can't use any of those options. And by actually putting in these jigsaw pieces around the outside, you are very much likely reducing some of the access needs to the city centre, because there will be some people who would like to use a system like the one um, Councillor Looker described. And there'll be some people who having a bench every 10 metres or whatever, that is enough to help them get to where they want. It's just, we can't forget those people who do need that access, but we can reduce the need for that by putting these other measures in place. And it's just, it's about thinking the big picture whilst not forgetting the 78% of people, 78% of blue badge holders that responded to the council survey last year that disagreed or strongly disagreed with the statement there is parking close enough. Those people cannot access the city centre. And of those 78, there will still be, even if you put in all these amazing fancy ideas, there will still be a percentage of people who cannot access the city centre. Thanks. I, I think that is a very important point. And, and I guess I'll just slightly use my discretion to jump in here as well and, and to say to, to officers, I don't know whether we have data around the number of people for whom there isn't a mitigation available, because I think that certainly it's been said several times um, from people that there will be a potentially reasonably small number of that seven and a half thousand blue badge holders in the city for whom there is simply no alternative than to use a vehicle to come into the city centre and therefore we're at risk of potentially discriminating against that group and I, I don't know whether we've what analysis we've done to date on that and what data is possibly available to be able to get a better clearer understanding of, of that particular cohort Neil, I don't know if you want to comment on that. Looking to the specific data in respect of York, I think it's important for officers to remind the executive that we're not just talking about the seven and a half thousand blue badges, blue badge holders in the city. Whilst these might be small percentages, this could be thousands of people across the whole of the UK who effectively will be impacted because our city centre highways are not available just to York residents, they're available to residents across the whole of the UK so it's a, that will have to come into consideration by this committee and indeed by members when they make that decision. I absolutely note that and well just 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 one second I, I think in a way that almost really emphasizes just how important it is that we have a clear understanding of that then because if, if it's 
several thousand or, or possibly more people that we could be discriminating against that you know that that would be obviously very serious um helen was there ever any analysis done pre-covid just to establish kind of how often the bays were being used because you can only park on them for three hours and there is only a very limited number so even if it was all open back up again we're still not going to get thousands of people using it there's just not enough spaces <laughs> I don't know if anybody has any an answer to that in terms of there was some data done. It was done as part of the first round of hostile vehicle mitigation. I think it was around 80 to 100 a day, but we can bring that to the 8th of uh again. I, I think if we could have some of that data mm -hmm. on the 8th of November, both what was done around the hostile vehicle mitigation measures and then potentially current data on, on what we think might be the types of, you know, the sorts of numbers of people that we're talking about, I think would be very helpful. Um, Jane, I'm seeing you waving, is that as a supplementary on this topic as well? Yeah. Just pop your microphone on. In all the time I've been going into town and parking, I've never not found a space until the, this, um, the city centre has been closed off. And now in the new parking base to exist, it, uh, it's it's a scrum to get a place because they're loading bays and blue badge bays. They're not just blue badge bays. And there are lots of people parked to go who are going to the Dean Court Hotel who don't have blue badges. There are delivery, Uber Eats, drivers. And I would say it's quite dangerous in the, in the way it is. I know my cousin is a wheelchair user and she, she felt very vulnerable swinging her wheelchair out into the road because she could have been hit. And if, if you want to see an example of a dangerous part of York, it's now the, the Minster, which is, seems incredible in the Duncan Place area around the Dean Court Hotel and all around that area. But and then I've been there and had to sit and wait. I've never had to sit and wait when Goodrum Gate was open and I've never known it to be, you know, chock-a-block full with thousands of cars queuing up to get in. I'm sorry, uh, I think if we can take into account that, um, the comments there and, and, and bring, you know, as much analysis as we as we can get together before the 8th of November, I think would be would be very helpful. Yeah, thank you. Um, I've got, I can see Councillor Douglas and Councillor Webb with hands of these supplementaries or are these just additionals, right? I, I shall put you onto the list. Um, I just want to take a bit of a temperature test of the room, not with the windows open, but um, I'm just mindful it's, it's 20 to four. And I did say that we wouldn't take an adjournment, but I have got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight people on my list for questions. Now I'm quite happy to continue on either right now and, and take all of those questions. I'm also happy to take a five minute adjournment and um, continue with questions. I think realistically, with seven or eight people wanting to ask questions, uh, we probably are looking at uh, the best part of another hour, I would have thought. Um, although obviously would li like to try to keep uh, things as close to time as we can. So would members prefer, uh, and, and those around the, the table, a, a five minute adjournment or uh, to continue on? And Councillor Runciman, I know you do have an uh, meeting. I've got a go meeting to, to chair, so I will have to go in about 10 minutes. Okay, doke. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's, let's take a quick five minute break then. What, what I'll suggest we do is um, we break now and we come back at 10 to 4. Um, I'm, I've got a list of people with, with questions. Um, can I ask you to use your time to think about how you can put that across as succinctly as possible? That would be, that would be very good. Thank you.
Right, everybody, welcome back uh, to this afternoon's joint commission scrutiny between the uh, Health and Adult Social Care Committee and the Customer Corporate Services and Scrutiny Management Committee. Um, we uh, have had one or two people that have had to leave um, at the break. Um, Councillor Runciman uh, has another meeting and gives apologies. Mm -hmm. Councillor Hollier has another meeting and is hoping that he will be able to come back if it's a quick one. Uh, and Professor Grady uh, also has had to leave. Um, a couple of members have indicated that they will need to leave reasonably soon. So I'm going to bump them up the list for questions. Um, if I could just reiterate to the number of people with waiting to ask a question, if we can just uh, try to keep it succinct and, and if there are any responses, if it can be reasonably succinct. And what I'll do is I'll work towards trying to round the meeting up at half past four. Um, can't promise I'll be bang on half past four, but that's what I will aim to be doing. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to invite Councillor Heaton and then Councillor Baker to ask both of their questions consecutively. Um, and then if there's any responses needed, uh, and then we'll come to Councillor Bassey, who was technically next on the list. So Councillor Eaton. Thank you. Um, mine's more on the statement category. Really. There was a point that sort of stood out to me during the presentation where it was saying that uh, there was no legal basis to allow access. Um, I'm thinking how we've got here today. Um, that does strike me as sort of part of the problem really as to how we've got here because we seem to be looking at you know struggling for reasons to allow access when if we are in fact as uh, neil said treating everyone as citizens of york um we, we need to really demonstrate a really good reason not to allow people to have access um so as the uh, recommendations come in as exec then considers this i hope really we have that um that thought process in mind rather than you know what good reason do we have to let people in thank you uh councillor baker hello that was a comment but if you could pop your microphone on that'd be great thanks Okay, thanks, Chair. Um, yes, my question was asked already. Um, and so I will follow it up with thinking about uh, the, the small group of, the smaller group of um, Blue Badge users, because obviously um, Blue Badge users are not a homogenous group. So the data that you asked for, Councillor Crawshaw, um, I think is on my mind a lot about who are these the people for which there are no other options that data would be very useful um and i wanted to ask officers whether the the options that um david's group talked at talked about last week at cvs which was from from the human rights and equalities board meetings that i've been at very much supposed to be a, a co-design opportunity so the options to do with automatic number plate recognition movable barriers have um these been looked at already can you i don't know whether it's um neil or or um any of the officers that are here that can talk about what you what your opinion of of those options is have they been already been assessed james i don't to answer um they, they are things that we are continuing to look at. The challenge with automatic number plate recognition for blue badge holders um, is that a blue badge isn't dedicated to a, a vehicle, it's, it's for a person, and the person can be a passenger in a friend's vehicle and still have that right. So in terms of writing the traffic regulation order, allowing blue badge holders access on a number plate is difficult i'm not saying it's impossible but it is difficult to legislate for um so it's it's you know something we are talking to other authorities about about how do you make this work because as i say it isn't easy to do in that sense thank you i think just as a, as a comment um coppergate we operate a whitelist i think don't we where you have a, a vehicles that are allowed through and not fined um, so is that the sort of mechanism that might potentially be able to, I, I appreciate some of the issues around it, it, it potentially, but it comes back to that challenge that Neil talks about that when we write the legislation, it has to apply to every blue badge holder in the country. Mm -hmm. 
and and it's it's there isn't a national database of those on reg numbers because they as i say you can get in a taxi and use your blue badge yeah but my understanding of, of um i think it's bath that we, we talked about earlier is that they have a mechanism whereby you register the vehicle that you'll be traveling in but I don't know what the. Yeah. I mean, again, I don't. We'll, we'll provide, we've the, said that we'll we'll provide the analysis for the next. Yeah, meeting. yeah, no, that's helpful. Was this supplementary on this particular aspect? Yeah, Jane. In the in the charging zone in London, the congestion charge. If your vehicle is registered as disabled, which mine is, um, you're exempt from paying it. But I know that you know when I've had to hire a car, for instance. I'm going with my blue badge. That was more difficult, but I could write to them retrospectively about that. So it is a way that you know there is a way of doing it in other authorities. Um, yeah. Thank you. So again, if if we can look at what's available elsewhere and what the legislative implications would be, that'd be great. Um, so next, I had Councillor Vassi. Thank you, Chair. I absolutely support the right of those with mobility challenges to access the city centre that we all hold in common. I do, however, want to bring a different vision of York's future and how that right of access can be delivered. A, a vision that challenges all sides, all of us, to think differently and engage differently with our future. We're days away from COP26. Surely the right we are seeking to address is a fundamental right of access, not a fundamental right to use a car. And I worry that we confuse these things and don't understand them. So what other solutions are there? And why aren't we discussing them today? Well, in Dijon, population 220,000, our twin city, they have a different approach to access. They have an electric shuttle bus with 29 stops, all with wheelchair access that serves the entire historic city centre. Just imagine if we had that in York, 29 stops across our city centre. You could stop at uh, pharmacies, the cinema, St. Samson's Centre, the theatres, shops, the Minster. You could stop all around the city without having to have cars in the city centre. There's nothing in this on this in our papers today, though we do have the phrase that we want to develop long term social, environmental and economic strategic vision for the city. So what is the council doing to evaluate and develop the approach taken by cities like our twin city of Dijon to find zero carbon public transport solutions that will ensure high quality access to the city centre for all York's residents now and in the future without continuing dependency on the private car. And secondly, have we have officers consulted with blue badge holders and disabled groups across York on zero carbon alternatives, public transport alternatives as a solution to the dilemma we face with blue badge holders? Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Bassi. Uh, I can see both Helen and Neil wanting to uh, respond to the points you've made there. Um, I'll allow Helen first and then, and then Neil. Um, I suspect that we may have some of the same points, to be honest. Um, I do believe this report, or perhaps one of the other ones that was kind of linked to all of this work, did talk about a shuttle system um, and a feasibility something into that sorry if my words have gone um it will not work for those disabled people who need that essential access it will work as part of the jigsaw of options which will which will work for some disabled people and some disabled visitors it will not work for all and in terms of the environmental argument at the moment york disability rights forum is hearing over and over and over again about people who are having to use their private vehicle to go to Malton, to go to North Allerton, to go to Harrogate, because these are places that they can get to and therefore are having to use much more carbon um, to get there than they would if they just came to York City Centre. Um, or online shopping, which comes with excess packaging and sometimes you can end up buying something that was coming from China and that's surely much, much worse for the planet. Um, and as it stands at the moment, 
I'm not aware of any wheelchair adapted electric vehicles that are hireable through motor mobility. So our limit, our options are very limited on a national level as well as locally. Thanks, Helen. Uh, Neil? This is microphone. Age 21, we are looking at the feasibility study in terms of the, uh, a sustainable bus. But uh, in terms of the uh, feedback from the consultations that we've had, yeah, clearly that has been advocated to us that the dialer ride and, the, and that shuttle bus arrangement isn't suitable for, for all. But in terms of your point in respect of um, fully electric adaptable vehicles, if you could drop me a line, I'm, that's the first time. I've heard most of everything that's been said tonight, to, today, but that's the first time I've heard that being said. So clearly as a council, that's something we need to look to address with the uh, car hire industry and the disabled uh, adaptation industry for the provision of those cars. Thanks, Neil. And, and I think I would I'd just add, I, I think I think you're right, uh, Councillor Vassi, in, in the sense of needing to look at lots of different solutions and um, some of those solutions have multiple different benefits to them. And, 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 I, and I think that that's, that's the case. But I think the way that Helen described it earlier as, as being that jigsaw of measures, and, and, I, and I think that's kind of one of the key things that I'm hearing from people today is that it's not something that you can always mitigate your way out of. And, and, and there is this kind of thorny issue, for want of a better phrase, of a, a group of people. Sorry, that makes it sound like I'm, I'm making it sound like you're the thorny issue. That's, that's not right. It's not the people that are the thorny issue. But it's that, that really difficult um, question of saying, if you have a group of people for whom there is no alternative than to use the blue badge vehicle to, to get access. And if you remove that access, you are therefore removing their ability to go into the city centre. Are we happy that we're doing that as a council? Because I think that's effectively what, what people are saying is that, is that it, there may be loads and loads of different mitigations, lots and lots of different solutions that will work for some people, some groups, some, some different um, uh, blue badge holders, but there will always be a group for whom those mitigations will not work and then what do you do and then what are we comfortable with and i, and I think that's perhaps where where we're reaching at the moment um going down my list actually it was helen i had you next for a question um which i don't know if you can recall a lot of time back <laughs> um it was more kind of a point of context i think and i meant to say it a long time ago in the meeting um as i said earlier 78 percent of blue badge holders in the survey had said they couldn't park close enough and therefore were being unable to get into the city centre. Um, we recently did a survey of our members and 69% of them said that they can't access the city safely. Um, that if they can't access the city safely or with the kind of without health implications, um, their quality of life was poorer, which in part then automatically if you're if you're keeping somebody out of a city center where they're unable to meet their friends family kind of engage in social life you're vastly increasing the chance of isolation and loneliness um, and the council's got an age-friendly york document that includes some really awful statistics about social isolation um, lacking social connections can damage a person's health as much as smoking 15 cigarettes a day it can lead to developing all kinds of diseases and increases the risk of dying by 29%. So do we want that for York's residents? Thank you. I think that is helpful context. Um, and again, that's something perhaps that particularly health scrutiny members might want to think about and consider when we're thinking about this um, uh, whole uh, issue. Um, I'm going to bring in Councillor Mason now, um, who uh, I'm just going to prioritise people who haven't asked any question at all at the moment and, and then um, work back through. So, Councillor Mason. Thank you. The, the one <clears throat> perk of waiting all this time means I've probably got more points. Um, just a quick one to say that I do have a blue badge and, and have lots of families, uh, family members that have blue badges. I know we're not making decisions, but I'm just making that decision to declare it. Um, uh, I'll try and cut through these in some order. I suppose one thing that's important for me is it isn't just about parking, um, uh, not for me personally, but I know, for example, when we had a disabled um, visitor to the mansion house, they had to try and walk to somewhere where they could get picked up. And, it, um, uh, and having that, like we've heard before, 
uh, Duncan Place being the kind of closest space to properly park it isn't ideal. So I think, you know, wait to Blake Street being used in some kind of novel form as um, parking or dropping off, I think is really important to look at. Um, I wonder with our um, equality impact assessment, if we've had any kind of external scrutiny of them or taking any advice on them to check that where we've got that process right or what, what's in there is, uh, uh, is good. Uh, th third one, I was in uh, Chester the other weekend with Councillor Oral and um, saw firsthand the, uh, their disabled parking. Uh, I wouldn't say it was, it was fantastic. Um, it, it, you know, the, we did do a lot of walking around part of the shopping centre or shopping streets and access wasn't great, um, but the, the manned barrier was very good where you could talk to somebody and press a button and um, show them your blue badge and it did at least get you to part of the way. So that's maybe a, you know, some things in Chester to learn from, maybe others not. Um, the issue around terrorism, obviously we, we look at times and we talk about terrorism, but um, from obviously looking at the attacks in London and things, those happen at night. And obviously we have a very vibrant nighttime economy. And I just wonder how that all kind of sits around it. Uh, and the last one was just about um, Fosgate and, uh, and Castlegate. If they're not included in this scheme and they become back to being uh, open, how licensing then works with them, um, with those and then how that fits around that terrorism picture and how, how you kind of square that circle of them being different, but not a risk, particularly Fosgate. Thank you. Just to follow up on the, the Chester uh, comment that Councillor Mason made, uh, I wasn't clear in the uh, report from uh, in the papers whether it was referring to uh, things that had been done post pandemic, the emergency measures, but when we were there, uh, certainly a very long road in the city centre was not accessible for, for cars. Uh, it was a busy day, so perhaps that was as described earlier. Uh, but there was a considerable, certainly more than 80 metres that's been mentioned, that people uh, with disabilities couldn't uh, physically access that part of Chester. Um, but the report does give some interesting concepts of what Chester have done. Thank you, that's uh, helpful. And apologies, my, even though my phone is on silent, my alarm is going off to tell me it's time to pick up my son from school, but it's half term, so it's clearly... A this, uh, alarm. Um, I think we've, we've talked already about some of those uh, measures coming back um, to the 8th of November, looking at some of the other local authority areas, so um, won't linger on that. My understanding from the report is that Chester won a European Access Award in 2017, so I think I would assume that some of what they've done is, is predates um, pandemic. Um, but again, it'd be interesting to see how they've um, addressed some of the same issues that we've had around um, social distance and accessing and, and I guess the terrorism stuff will be post 2017 as well. Um, so just going uh, again down my list, um, unless officers had any comments to, to the two things that uh, Councillor Mason and, and Councillor Oral had raised there, I think they were more generic questions rather than specifics. Um, so I have actually Councillor Webb twice on my list, um, but if you would like to ask one or both of your questions uh, now, that'd be great. Thank you. You'll be glad to know that one of them's pretty much been answered. Um, it was regarding the, the mitigating factors that we've talked about, whether that's dial a ride, et cetera. Um, because obviously we, we're in a position here where we're having to think, are those mitigations enough? And Helen, you, you've already commented quite eloquently about that, but I know that Jane, you originally raised it um, when you first spoke. So I, I did wonder if you had any further comments on, on those mitigations. But then my, my only other thing would be um, more of a comment, really. I think this, this report is actually quite disappointed in the fact that we've heard several times today that we'll, we'll get the information back on the 8th of November and we'll, there's, oh, there's this bit of analysis that needs to be done for another meeting. And I, and I, I, mean, I know I'm only a sub on this committee, but it does seem like there's a fair bit missing. And I, I hope that that isn't always the case um, and then finally my other comment would be um, twofold one I think that the recommendations made at the the very last page of this document the human rights uh, your human rights city networks recommendations I think all four of them are, are really really good and things that we should be looking at and I would highly recommend them myself and the last one 
from me is the how does all of this link into the pending um, the impending local transport plan um, because I would hate for us to have had all of these conversations only to have to come back and do it all again um, so yeah so how does that link in Thanks, Councillor Webb. I don't know if you can comment um, in terms of the local transport plan. I don't want to take us too far down that route because that's a, no a whole can of worms to get into as well. But I would agree, Councillor Crawshaw, uh, and clearly that will be a matter for members. The only, the only thing I would point out in terms of the um, issue of going around the circle again is one of the things that I think is in the paper is that the police can issue uh, a request to the uh, City Council to put a terrorism transport regulation order in place and which they'd have to undertake their own assessment. And that would, again, bring this batter, matter back into the, the remit of the council to reconsider. So just as uh, traffic regulation orders that whatever is decided on the 18th of November, that won't be it forever. They will constantly need to be reviewed and refreshed. Then other factors come into play, such as a request from the police or indeed a view of a future administration as to what is or what isn't contained in their local transport plan. But members would then have an EIA to consider whether or not they introduce that or not. Thanks, Neil. I, I, I suppose the one thought I would just offer up it, it is perhaps building something on, on Councillor Vass's point that um, it, it just serves to highlight again the, the need for that local transport plan, because actually whether we're talking blue badge access or, or, or any other vehicle access, you know, making the city centre as accessible as possible without the need to rely on a car, unless the car is the only means by which you, you can access the city centre, um, is, is clearly something that we need to do more about, I, I would suggest. Um, I have next uh, Councillor Douglas, and then I think Scott, did, were you indicating you wanted to say something? You were sort of raising your, your eyebrow at me, and I wasn't sure if it was a if it was a, a hand or, or not. Uh, but certainly, Councillor Douglas, if 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 you, if you were, you, I could bring you in next, and then uh, otherwise, Councillor Fenton after that. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to echo what uh, Councillor Webb said about missing information in the report, and it's um, a shame that we didn't have more in front of us. And I'm particularly concerned around the results of consultation when it's been raised with me on many occasions by different residents and groups that they feel as though the council's communication style around the consultations has been quite leading and has had or seemed to have some idea of what answers they want and therefore leading the public. And I think what um, Professor Greedy was saying earlier about the trust level around this, and this is a big part of where that trust comes from, that people are not convinced that they are really being consulted um, and I, I just wanted to raise that. I don't know whether we have any answers for that today, but I, I think it's an ongoing problem in the council that really needs to be looked at around our communication style, around these consultations. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Douglas. I think Neil had a response to that. And Helen, do you want to add something as well? Just a, the point in terms of this being a pre-decision scrutiny and we're a month ahead of the actual decision by executive, um, that's why they said the formulation of the analysis ha hasn't been taken, undertaken. And indeed, um, we've got a consultation that closes today. But I think, um, sorry, I can't remember your second name, but I think it's David uh, made the point very early on in terms of the human rights. It's about also the, vote, the protection of the rights of the minorities and consultation statistics when they brought forward within the reports will just be one element of the consideration by members. And it won't be a case that the consultation said most people wanted this thing, that that is the right thing that ultimately should happen. So we just need to be aware of the fact that consultation is just a, a way of informing, in part informing the decisions. They're not definitive in providing evidence of one way or another, which way the decision makers should make their decisions. Thank you. Um, Helen, I think you wanted to add something. Were, were you waving as a supplementary as well? Councillor? Okay, so Helen first and then Councillor. Sorry, I've gone completely blank. What, what was it, the point that was just made before? Sorry, I can hold one thing in my head at this time That's of right. day. I, I think it was around consultation. And, oh, yes, and around this trust. thing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, I think 
sort of from my perspective it feels like there's different levels of listening kind of occurring within the council and we can have a really good conversation with an officer and it can feel like you know some of the things around it have been understood and then all of that then gets put into a report and it's covering 10,000 things at once including pavement cafes and this that and the other and then that then goes higher up to the you know and it, it feels like by the time it's got to anyone who can make a decision that is the key bit i think it's the message is getting lost i think that, you know that covid has made it a lot harder to talk to people um you know having zoom workshops was just you know on its own wasn't ideal but it's what happens with what is being said and sometimes the statistics are being skewed so there was this statistic the council keeps mentioning about this many disabled people agree with the foot streets but not everyone who's disabled has a blue badge and not everyone who's blue badge who has a blue badge identifies as disabled and you can also agree with something in principle and still need the access so they're not it, it that feels i think just mm -hmm. to clarify a bit around where that sense of dis of trust being lost and not feeling communicated it's it's kind of like it feels like we say something and then the bit that comes out at the end is not quite what we said um and there have been some councillors that we've been able to have conversations with or email exchanges with um and yet the um executive member for transport has not been one of those we have tried um, so I think it's just those different layers of listening and different kind of responses from different parts of the council as an organisation. Thank you. And then Councillor Webb, I think you wanted to add a supplementary as well. Yes, thank you. And I think it's very disappointing that Councillor de Gaulle has not been as open as it as he could be and not been helpful. And I'm hope that that changes. Um, it was it's more back on what uh, Neil said, really. I mean. This is, as you said, pre-decision scrutiny and how are we meant to scrutinise any possible decisions if we don't necessarily have all the facts and information in front of us. And it isn't like this is a completely brand new issue. It's been going on for quite a while now. So I think that's an important point to make. And, and just another point, really, the majority might want something to happen and that might be the right thing to do. but. Also, it might not be, and I think we have to be very careful that any decision that is taken really should have the right to non-discrimination at the heart of it, which is basically what the whole conversation has been about today, and I don't want that to be lost. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Webb. And, and just to um, remind members, um, we will be having a third meeting on the 8th of November um, where we will undertake a formal pre-decision um, on, on anything that's going ahead to executive. I think we've already had a commitment for a number of additional pieces of information to be brought to that meeting. Um, so hopefully some of those missing pieces of information will be available for uh, the, the CSMC screening committee to, to undertake that pre-decision with, with all of that information at its um, fingertips, as it were. Um, I'm conscious of the time and I, and I would like to try and wrap us up at, at half past four if we can. Um, I'm still not sure, Scott, whether you're, you're raising your eyebrows at me was wanting to, to come in and, and comment. No, um, I mean, but if, if you did want to, and, and then Councillor Fenton. I Councilor suppose I just have, have a quick point. And it's been mentioned that Councillor Douglas talked about um, communications. And I know we spoke a little bit earlier about trust potentially uh, breaking down. And I don't think it needs to kind of be like this. I think there are solutions. I think it's about how we work with and through each other uh, going forward. It's, it's, it's not necessarily part of you've now been consulted. The words uh, that I know we, we mention uh, often, uh, co-production, co-design, co-creation. I think if people are uh, involved at the outset of these, um, I suppose, decisions and, and, and understand the, the, the flow of that information, we'd never get to this position of, of offering up counter arguments and things like that. And I think, um, I don't know if this is the correct forum to sort of raise something like this, but I've been working with multiple groups across York to, to design something called a street charter, which I'd be happy to sort of bring to a different council meeting where it would set out a framework of how we work with and, and through each other around um, 
accessing our streets uh, for everybody, not just the, the, the odd topic or two around whizzy e-scooters or this and that, it, it sets out how we work, what we do within accessible crossings and parking on pavement and airboards, like we mentioned previously, wheelie bins, street and cafe furniture. It sets out in one sort of document how, what the rules of engagement are and what people's uh, experiences of that sort of shared space and built environment are. So I don't know whether I should have mentioned that here, but I thought, given you, you let me have the mic, so I did. <laughs> no, I, I think that's very um, useful. I, I, I know we've had a little bit of conversation about um, Street Charter previously. Um, just if I've got the understanding correct, this is something that my site has developed, but it developed in, co in, in that's the right word, uh, in conjunction yeah. with a number of other yeah. organizations yeah it's, that... it's, it, well, it's not been easy actually it's been it's probably a long sort of year of, of multiple meetings and conversations but the groups involved who are now speakers one are, are of course my site york the wilberforce trust uh, the royal national institute of blind people york disability rights forum york site loss council guide dogs for the blind york older people's assembly in age uk york uh, uh, everybody who, who's endorsed this this new uh, charter but now it would be working with the local authority to to get behind and have have a, have a, like I say, a framework that puts policy at the heart of decision making. I mean, that, that certainly sounds um, like something that could be useful for us to bring through um, as part of this discussion. I don't, I don't know whether it's something that would be appropriate for us to, to introduce the 8th of November, because that's more about decision making on the foot streets specifically, I think. Um, but what we perhaps could do is have a think about whether or not there's a route by which that could come through, possibly not as the decision making process on this, but as possibly something that is certainly sounds worthy of some further investigation. Uh, Neil, did you want to come in? As, as chair of corporate, you might want to ask uh, economy and place scrutiny whether to put it on their work plan. Yeah, that's... Let's have a think about how we can introduce that, but I, I think that that certainly sounds like something that's that's we should be looking at. Um, so, uh, last couple of people that I've got on my list, I have Councillor Fenton and then Councillor Oral, and I reckon if we're really smart, we can get done in five, the next five or six minutes and, and uh, be just about done for half past. Thank you, Chair. Just a quick question for um, which Janie maybe maybe will answer on the back of Councillor Mason's question around. Um, legal advice and equality of impact assessments in terms of what um, advice the council is seeking, either, either internal or external around its duties under the um, equalities and human rights legislation in regard to this issue. Um, so, so the council is receiving external specialist legal advice in respect of this particular issue, which include it's all parameters of it, focusing on the EIA and sort of everything is the uh, barrister will receive the recording of this meeting the next one meeting three etc so it's all information relating to all of this and any other material that is felt relevant to the decision making so they are heavily consulted at all stages can i just double check on that when we're talking about specialist legal advice we're talking Specialist Local Government or Specialist Equalities Act or Specialist Human Rights or... What, so it's a barrister who specialises in equalities related issues. Okay, thank you. Jane, did you just pop your microphone on, please. Is that publicly available? The, is it publicly available, the advice that you're getting? Um, not at this moment, no, because it's still in its formulation and there's other topics that still I've asked more questions on and I wanted the barrister to have note and have sight of this meeting. She can't watch it live. So um, I need her views on this, but no, it's not available publicly at the moment. And will it be available? Um, I need to consider that position once I'm in receipt of it. Um, the elements that I've had are only in draft and I'll make a decision at the time when I can, when I've got the uh, a fuller opinion. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Um, I, I would assume, um, but you don't have to answer this, Janie. My, my assumption would be that if it's possible to make that public, it would be made public, um, unless there was good reason to, to not make that advice public. Yes, I'll make the decision at the time. Yeah. I just haven't seen the full opinion yet. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and then the final question I had was uh, Councillor Arrell. I don't know if it was a question or a comment. 
the mic's gone off. Um, I'm going to perhaps ask for information that's impossible to get. Um, Helen, I think, uh, encapsulated it uh, well in that when she said that every person with a disability is individual, they all have individual needs, not group needs. Uh, having spent a career working with children with and um, young adults with, with disabilities, uh, you can work a, a lesson or a system that helps one child but then discriminates against another. So I think the, the information that I'd like is, are there any, uh, is there any information as to how many people have benefited from uh, the city centre being car free? And if we then put cars back, how many uh, people would that discriminate against? Whether you can find that information, I don't know. This is, this is where I wish we had Professor Grady still present, because I think that a lot of his um, thing is, is around how you balance different people's needs and, mm -hmm. under the various different legislations. And, and I think one of the things that becomes very difficult is if there's any, and I'm not for a second suggesting the other in this council oral, but if there's any suggestion of setting one group against another group in terms of their needs, that then becomes very difficult territory to, to sort of step into. And it's, it, you're right, it's, it's a really hard one to, to measure, isn't it, in terms of um, you know how you how you get both? I don't know, Neil, if you've got any yeah, comments on that. Just to say, and it picks up some of the themes that have come out here today. Is you know, as, as a one of the senior members of the council's uh, corporate management team, just to reflect, there is no such thing as perfect uh, decision making, and there's no such thing as perfect information. Um, clearly, there will be people who benefit from a car-free city centre, and there will be a significant number of people who will effectively be disadvantaged from a car-free city space, whatever that be. Uh, we will obviously do as best we can in terms of the the reports from members. But just to be clear, we're not going to come up with definitive figures that say that this is the balance that is to be struck between the two. It's going to be a difficult decision, uh, and that's why you know I get out of bed every morning is because I work for a democracy, not somebody who just doesn't listen to anybody and makes those sorts of decisions. Thank you, Neil. And um, Helen, did you have a comment as well? Um, yeah, just to speak to um, Councillor Oral's point, um, something that keeps getting thrown around a lot is a, is a, I can't remember if it's a figure or if it's just a statement that there are some disabled people who benefit from and enjoy the foot streets. And there's kind of two parts to that. One is, are they a blue badge holder? Because that will affect, you know, I, a street that has no cars on, I think, would be ideal for most people. If you know, as long as if you have a car, you can get to it. Um, but also the context within around the statistic or the comment, um, I believe there was an implication that people with um, and you might be able to speak more to this, Scott, but that with sight loss, um, the statistic was being used to kind of say, well, these disabled people might be wanting access, but this group of people with sight loss are, you know, benefiting from it. And my understanding was that survey was taken, um, it was so it was September 2020, I believe, and the COVID situation was very different. Social distancing was still a very big thing. And if you have sight loss, that's a very different scenario to try and navigate in a street with cars compared to without cars. So I just wanted to kind of caveat the various points that the context of the question matters a lot, particularly at the moment. Thank you. Jane, did you want to comment on, yeah. pop your microphone on? When you dug down into the figures, I think two people with uh, who were visually impaired said that they were in favour out of the hundreds that had been of people who had been asked in the consultation as well. Uh, yeah. so if, if, it's a bit careful of what you're looking at and what, you know, how many people thought this was a great thing. And, and, I, and I think both Scott on behalf of my site and, and the, the speaker at the start of the meeting um, on behalf of the Site Loss Council, I think we both made it very, very clear that they weren't wanting to go down the route of setting one group against another or any of that, which, uh, as I say, I, I don't think is, is at all what Councillor Oral is suggesting either. It's just that difficult how you create that safe space to have those conversations sometimes about, about those different things. 
I think um, what I'm going to do now, I've got my eye on the time there. Um, so I'm just going to kind of summarise where I think we've we've got to. And unless anybody has any kind of burning thing that I've missed off or forgotten, um, then, you know, draw the meeting to a close. Um, hopefully you've all found that helpful. I, I think we've covered a lot of ground there on a, a very difficult range of topics in one sense, um, but I think it's been very useful. So what I've got that I've managed to sort of scribble down is that we will bring back to the 8th of November um, data that we can find on any crashes involving vehicles, particularly blue badge uh, holders in the city centre, um, clarifying what the speed limits are in the city centre. Um, I think a general point was made around use of language and, and how we have those conversations and, and sometimes both language when talking to different groups, but also in terms of um, when we're undertaking consultation and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, we talked about the uh, Equalities Impact Assessment being a live document, and I think we're interested in how that might be updated in light of the York Human Rights City Network comments. Uh, and I think we said, if, if at all possible, we'll bring back some analysis on uh, that Human Rights City Network report to the 8th of November meeting as well. Um, and again, uh, bring any information on the consultation which has been underway and is closed today. Uh, bring back that to the 8th of November. Um, I think we wanted to look at data around the use of blue badge bays, um, I think particularly mentioned around the Minster, Duncan Place, um, and where some of that's been um, loading bays and blue badge bays have, have been used together. And I think what we were looking at for was data on the pre the changes and post the changes. So some comparative data around what the um, impacts um, might have been. Um, and uh, we wanted to look at some data around um, such as we can get it, what the kind of breakdown within the seven and a half thousand or so blue badge holders are in the city, um, notwithstanding the points that you make, Neil, about the, 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 the whole of the UK, um, just to get a, an understanding of how many people might be completely excluded from accessing the city centre. Um, because all of those other pieces of the jigsaw that, that Helen's mentioned a few times wouldn't work for them. Um, so anything that we can do to kind of get an understanding of, of that, and I presume following from that, what the implication might be for decision making around if we determined that that was discriminatory and we were knowingly making a discriminatory decision, which I think Professor Grady was saying we needed to make sure we had a, you, you can do it, but you have to have a very, very high bar if you're knowing that that's what's what's happening. Um, and then the other thing I'd noted down was the street charter, which um, my site York had developed and we would think about what the most appropriate route to bring that through scrutiny would be, whether that's economy in place to perhaps have a look at that as a first step. Um, and then uh, I think Councillor Doughty had, had um, mentioned what feels like ages ago now about um, possibly looking at the recommendations of the um human rights city network report that i think there are four recommendations um and whether or not we wanted to endorse those recommendations um whether we want to perhaps we could either endorse them now as, as the two committees we could uh ask that the committee on the 8th of november considers whether it wants to endorse them um with a recommendation to executive um i'll leave that open in terms of i don't know councillor doughty if, if you wanted to perhaps comment on that well, I, certainly Councillor Webb, I think, was supportive of, of that context too. And I, I think other other members that are here on behalf of health, supportive of that, that way forward, it looks like it. So on that basis, yes, please. Okay, so if we take forward to the 8th of November, uh, Janie was just whispering in my ear about, obviously we've also got the economy in place joint scrutiny this evening as well. So perhaps what we could do is record that the members of health scrutiny committee would be happy to endorse those uh, recommendations um, we could pose the same question perhaps to economy in place if we end up touching on that although i suspect that this evening's discussion might be slightly um, different um, and then if we come back to the 8th of november meeting with a view to whether the committee as a whole then wants to make a formal recommendation to to put forward to executive does that make some sense councillor douglas 
Yeah, I just, um, I, I'm totally in agreement and I just wanted to add in addition that when you go to the meeting on the 8th of November asking that the health scrutiny board um, committee rather asks them formally to consider um, endorsement of those recommendations that we have, but also asking the 8th of November meeting formally to do that. Thank you. Yeah, we can record it like that. I think that makes sense. And uh, Councillor Fenton. Um, I think in terms of the the question of, of endorsing the Human Rights Easy Network report, the, I think one of the, the reasons I asked about uh, the officer analysis was certainly I would I would want to be able to see that and understand the officer comments on the recommendations in the report before um, coming to a, a, a judgment on on all of the the uh, all of the proposals. For example, one of them, which I would want to unpack and understand some more, is the recommendation that all current restrictions on blue badge access should be lifted. It wasn't clear to me about whether that <clears throat> referred to the post-COVID emergency restrictions and or the existing foot street restrictions which have been in place for a number of years. So I think there are a number of aspects of that that I would want to explore in more detail before coming to a, a firm conclusion as to um, any or all of those recommendations that I'd be, I'd be comfortable to, to endorse at this particular moment. Thank you, Councillor Fenton. I, I understand that. I, I think the um, particular report is in respect of the temporary extension to the foot streets area, um, but obviously um, we, can, we can clarify that. Um, and I think perhaps something that we, we may also be wanting to consider for the 8th of November is um, around whether or not we feel that there's enough information to make a um, permanent change to the foot streets area. I know that there's been some discussion around whether or not a, a temporary continued extension um, pending further work around um, uh, how it might work for us, you know, for, for all residents. Um, so I think if we take that as, as being a formal request from the health scrutiny members present here today for us to consider um, at the 8th of November, um, whether or not we might want to make a uh, endorsement at that meeting based on the analysis that that's officers are, are making and obviously those committee members present, um, that hopefully covers covers all bases on that. Okay, so I think uh, on that note, um, I'd just like to thank everybody for coming and, and giving your input. Um, I, I think I can speak on behalf of, of all the committee members that that's been absolutely invaluable in terms of getting your insights and, and your willingness to answer questions and ask questions as well. Um, I think it's been very helpful and, and likewise officers, it's been uh, good to have you present and, and being able to take away uh, further information that we want to, to get at uh, and what have you. Um, so uh, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I'll draw the meeting to a close. And those of you who are attending at half past five, I will see you uh, very shortly, it would seem. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, Janie, just wants me to confirm there is no urgent business. So we're all done. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>